This is the queen herself, Matea. And her spirit rules here still. I felt it the moment I arrived. Anais Nin said it clearly. Intense living leaves its mark. And here on this landscape, I felt Matea's presence. Matea was queen of a kingdom in or near Zimbabwe. And when her kingdom was threatened by a long drought, she elected to travel south to consult with the legendary Queen Mujaji, the rain queen and beseech her to intercede with the ancestors and gods to bring rain to her ravaged land. This Majaji did, and Matea set off back to her kingdom, stopping off along the way, the legend says, near here, where there are still ruins built in much the same way as those of Great Zimbabwe. here on my own journey to revisit the places of my heart by seeking out unique and precious bush experiences in Africa. Now, escorted by Matea's genial manager, Shai Goodman, I'm traversing stone walkways that are themselves reminiscent of the architecture of Great Zimbabwe, heading for the main lodge at Matea. The doors of the lodge are Zanzibari, decorated in the late 19th century Indian style, much favored by Sultan Bargash. These intricately and beautifully carved doors, complete with brass studs to ward off marauding elephant, open onto a breathtaking vista of space, light, and African art. I'm greeted with a cocktail and survey the luscious tea time spread laid out to refresh weary travelers delectable stuff for the palate and the eye. Your eyes can also feast on a really spectacular and unique collection of African art. This huge bronze is the work of Kenyan sculptor Robert Glenn and depicts an impala ram dynamically escaping the outstretched claws of a hunting lioness. Part of the huge Matea collection is housed in this enormous treble volume sitting room all light and space and angles. Paul Augustinus's work is richly represented here. Enormous oils that capture not just the literalness of Africa, its vastness and beauty, but some of its mystery too. Prowling lions, umbrella acacias, buffalo at the edge of a swamp, and of course that unique effect of African light. The other enchanting thing about the Matea collection is its eclecticism. Its spirit is Pan-African, although West Africa is better represented than Central or Eastern Africa. It treats Africa as a continent, a cultural unity that's characterized by artistic and spiritual diversity, not by bizarre political boundaries laid down by Westerners in the 19th century. There's this intricately articulated elephant, for example, wise and powerful, but somehow whimsical, followed by this beautiful head of a queen from Benin, as poised and serene as the famous Egyptian head of Queen Nefertiti. Strangely, these artifacts sit quite happily alongside modern Western furniture, as if a spirit of good taste unites them, despite the vast cultural and chronological distance that separates them. And the modern sculptures by Donald Gregg, this breeding herd of elephant and this enchantingly observed warthog, have a kingship with the more ancient pieces from other parts of Africa. Like this Yoruba baptismal font, these idiosyncratic Ghanaian gold weights, reminiscent of Domia in their acute exaggerations. These Benin warriors cast in bronze, perhaps as early as the 14th century. And this drinking gourd from Benin, so oddly conceived. These beaded figures from the Barun tribe, depicting notables, 
heavily ornamented with cowrie shells to indicate their great wealth. The Matea collection is extensive and beautiful and housed without preciousness outdoors. My personal favorite is this statue of a princess from Benin. Depictions like this of female figures are apparently quite rare and this probably dates back to the 17th century. She's lovely and she stands guard over Matea as does this savage mounted warrior, Uran Miyan, who founded the second Benin dynasty. The vast teak deck at Matea looks out over the vast plains and inward to these magnificent pair of carved and decorated doors. They're known as the royal doors and were usually only commissioned by kings or other notables. They weren't really designed to be functional as doors. They were used as plaques to be displayed outside the entrance to the king's palace to impress visiting dignitaries. I'm no dignitary, but they certainly impressed me. The carving is exquisitely done, and the fineness of touch quite frequently visible reminds me of the delicacy of Cellini. Eventually, I simply surrender myself to the aesthetic experience and wander through the lodge, reveling in its treasures. My personal suite was equally beautifully decorated and included a bottle of complimentary bubbly to make me feel welcome. like a queen myself when I settled into the luxury of this gorgeous architecture and decor. Everything about the design was in perfect taste, but I was particularly taken by a lovely line drawing of an island in the Seychelles by Michael Adams, and by the close figuring of the marble in my bathroom. They spared no expense at Matea. Everything is finely judged and executed in perfect taste. From the oversized shower stall to the private plunge pool sunken into the teak deck outside my bedroom, all watched over by sentinels who stand guard as dusk rolls in from the hills towards Matea. That evening, I'm invited to a wine tasting in the cellar by the manager, Shai Goodman. Even the cellar has a share of precious objets d'art, in addition to which, Matea has an almost as precious collection of rare and desirable wines. They have a specially selected range of house wines, moderately priced and designed to represent the dominant South African cultivars, from the indigenous Pinotage to the more cosmopolitan Merlots and Cabernet Sauvignons. Shai is rightly proud of the magnificent stocked cellar and the unusual selection of wines from lesser-known vineyards. Separately housed in their own bins are a range of the most noble wines from South Africa and the world, the great vintage wines, 
wines that can take a decade cellaring before emerging austere 